Okay, it's uh, 7 o'clock, January 17th, 23, and this is a meeting of the Flood and Erosion Control Board. So, I'm going to start off by admin. I'm Don Lamberti, Vice Chair of the Committee. And want to introduce yourself? I'm Dick Mahusky, I'm the Secretary. Prue? Oh, I'm Prue O'Brien, the Recording Secretary. Okay. We're expecting other members to call in, but right now there's only two of us. So, as of that, we do not have an official meeting. We, as such, we cannot get any, uh, cannot take votes on anything. So, the first order of business was act upon the minutes of December 13th, 22. We can't do that because we don't have a no reason to. Shall we skip over it? Yes, we'll, we should just we'll defer that to our uh, February meeting. Right. So that would bring us down to the um, item number three. Here a presentation by the Ash Creek Conservation Conservancy Association. So uh, we have a presentation by the Conservancy Association. So would you like to get started? Yes. Um, can you switch it to share screen? Uh, do you not have the share screen on yours? Not yet. And on I, it says host disabled participant screen sharing. All right, that's what happened last time. Okay. Yeah. We'll have... Need to enable it, and then I can do it. All right. So let's see if I go here. Um, no. How the heck did that happen last time? There you go. Yeah, but that, this is my screen, though. I have to figure out how to share, how to let you share yours. Oh. So gonna, um, just one second. Let me see. Sure. Allow. Okay, if I make you co-host, tell yep. me if there's... If then I can that. do it. Then I can do okay. it, and then you can unmake me co-host afterwards. Okay, so let's see. Screen. How is that? Great. Looks good. Okay. All right. So um, we just want to start out by stating that we understand your commission focuses on flood and erosion control, not on improving our natural environment. However, you know, hopefully there is, you know, um, a cross purpose here. They do overlap. And since the municipal boundary runs down the middle of Ash Creek and through Great Marsh Island and the Barrier Spit, we want to make sure that we keep the appropriate boards in Fairfield informed. As you know, the Tidal Estuary provides some flood and erosion control by acting as a buffer against waves, and the tidal wetlands act like a sponge, reducing flooding from runoff. This report documents that we are experiencing serious erosion along the shoreline and loss of our tidal wetlands. <clears throat> it also takes into account the increased frequency and intensity of storms in the future due to climate change and the impacts of different scenarios for sea level rise in our residential neighborhoods. We've done a lot of studies um, over the past 10 years and we've commissioned five reports. Uh, the first report was back in 2012. And since that's 10 years old, now we've commissioned another master plan to guide us for the next 10 years. But we also did the eco history of Ash Creek. We created a shovel ready plan for the restoration of the barrier spit back in 2014. And then um, last year, we did the eco analysis of the barrier spit. And at that time, we discovered that the barrier spit shoreline had retreated 60 linear feet, and Great Marsh Island had lost 27,000 square feet. The new master plan looks at erosion issues across the entire estuary 
not just the barrier spit in Great Marsh Island. The scientists who studied Ash Creek determined that we're in the early stages of an ecological collapse. That's a technical term that means the tidal estuary is changing to another type of system, such as a bay. Ash Creek will no longer have its tidal wetlands by the end of the century, and it could lose its barrier spit, which protects the tidal estuary from wave action within the next 15 years. The factors causing the ecological collapse are the petals on this diagram that you see here. Um, we won't go into all the factors. It's all explained in the 68 page report, which I'll give you uh, the link to at the end. Uh, but the main thing to understand is the diagram on the right. Okay. What this says is that if we take action now, the costs are much less than if we wait until the collapse is further in progress. This is the time to go after grants and employ living shoreline solutions. So the master plan recommendations come, to, we've sort of um, summarized them here, um, is uh, in terms of erosion, creating some kind of a living shoreline. We don't know what that looks like yet because we need to have a lot of studies and um, we're working with Save the Sound on that but we need some kind of a living shoreline to reduce wave action and protect the tidal estuary. Now, the last master plan that we did 10 years ago did not take into account climate change and sea level rise. These have become issues that we need to factor into any planning these days. So um, one recommendation is to add sediment to the barrier spit and to Great Marsh Island and the wetlands overall for height. And that's because with the sea level rise, the marsh can't grow vertically fast enough uh, to avoid um, drowning. So can that's a question. What's can, that? Can, can you add sediment to a marsh without destroying the marsh? Yeah, it's called thin layer deposition. We have not, that's not been legally permitted yet by the Connecticut DEP in uh, the state of Connecticut, but it has been done in North Carolina and Southeastern, you know, um, United States. So we have spoken to the Connecticut DEP and they are, you know, pretty uh, favorable about it. Of course, they can't tell us they would absolutely permit it, but you know, they're they're very interested and they're feeling like if there's any place to do it, it's Ash Creek, because it's dying anyways. So what's the worst that could happen? You so know? Gail, what is, what is the process? Does does some entity have to develop a plan of action and then go to deep to to permit yes. that entity? Yeah, it? we we actually are we're working with yeah, we're working with Save the Sound, and Save the Sound um, created a um, developed a seven hundred thousand dollar plan for two years of studies to create a shovel ready plan to be able to do this. So that's just the plan. The plan alone costs seven hundred thousand, which I know sounds crazy, but there's whenever you start adding sediment to a tidal wetland, you're going against decades of laws about filling in tidal wetlands. So you got to know exactly what you're doing. And we also have the channel and we don't want the channel to be affected and fill in because of any of our actions. So it's, um, you know, it's kind of a, um, a tricky thing when we're trying to, to add sediment, but it's, it's definitely, um, the right thing to do, and it's very expensive, and you can't just do it one time. We're going to be doing this over and over again because obviously you can't just put a foot of sediment down. You're going to kill the grass. It's right, going to be, cool. yeah, it's going to be yeah. small amounts and over time. Okay, and um, they they do have 
a process for how to do this and um, and the equipment for doing this. But, um, you know, but we it's going to take two years of studies to figure out how. And then um, the other recommendation. I'm, I'm in the I'm in the meeting on Zoom, so you can oh. you can stop by. You can stop by. We'd love to have you. No, join unfortunately, us. I can't because I have an RTS. Meeting. Okay, yeah, Prue told me that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, I just if uh, and I real quick is we are working on that. No. Okay. Hey, Bill. 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 Yep. Okay. I'll 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 catch you later. Okay. Sure enough. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. All right. Bye. That was Bill Hurley. That was that was our one arm paper hanger, Bill Hurley. <laughs> I've been I've been I've been trying to tag up with him for a little bit here to get some updates for this meeting, but uh, so that wow. that was I I would hesitate to say Bill is forced to be a last minute responder, but he's last minute plus eleven minutes, I guess, or something. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, and, and just just in case depending on who listens to this or whatever. That is not disparaging at all. Bill Hurley is one of our stalwart supporters. Oh, he's he amazing. Is, he's oh, yeah. He's yeah we, we, very, we appreciate him, too. Yeah. Except the only problem is we need three of him. So. Right. Yeah. He's right. No, he'll be involved in all of this. You know, all of these studies will get Bill involved. And, so, uh, you know, so back so, to the, yeah. Go back ahead. Back to the thin layer deposition. Are you looking for thin layer deposition on the current marshy areas themselves, such as Great Island, Great, yes. Great Marsh Island? Yeah, that's lost 27,000 square feet. And, so. the sand, and the sand spit, or the sand spit is a different entity because, they're, because it is not routinely flooded where the marshes are. Well, actually, the sand spit is pretty routinely flooded with, you know, whenever there are storms, it gets washed over. And that's a real danger because once a channel forms and that gets cut off, um, we could lose the barrier spit. And in fact, the erosion is so progressive at this point that the scientists think the the barrier spit will be gone within 14 years, yeah, maybe sooner if there's like a, a major hurricane. So, um, so yes, it's the barrier spit, it's Great Marsh Island and the fringing tidal wetlands. All of that would be considered in the study and then recommendations would be made. Okay. Yeah. Thank and, um, you know, the other thing that is being recommended is to protect the barrier spit dunes and the vegetation, the seagrass that we planted from human Im impact. Um, you know, we've got um, the diamondback terrapins that are nesting there. We've got horseshoe crabs that are mating there. And, you know, it would be ideal to just not have people and dogs trampling the vegetation or disturbing the terrapins or the horseshoe crabs. So, you know, um, we're going to see what we can work out because, you know, the city of Bridgeport considers that an active recreation area and doesn't consider that like sort of a, you know, open space area. So okay. we'll, be, we'll be working with them on that. Um, do the ter do the terrapins go on the dry part where the sea grasses are, or do they? They, stay they in the love they love to be where the sea sea grasses are growing. That's where they prefer. We put a fence okay. all around it, and those poor terrapins they just kept that circling was gonna, that the was fence. Be my, yeah, that was going to be my follow on question. How can they get past the snow fence that was? They put up there? they can't, and so that's you know. That's why we would like to be able to just fence off the barrier spit so that the terrapin yeah. can freely roam and just, you know, fence it off during the terrapin nesting season and the horseshoe crab, you know, breeding season, you know, so we'll, we'll see what we can do with the city of Bridgeport on that. That's, that's going to be uh, a challenge. They're not as environmentally uh sensitive as fairfield is so i'm sure sure they are but they're, oh, they're, we don't have a conservation commission okay 
Yeah, we don't even have a flood and erosion control board. Mm -hmm. We don't even have uh, an inland wetlands board. I mean, we, we don't have anything like that. So it's, it's all about development because, you know, the city of Bridgeport, it's always been about bringing industry and it's not about preserving nature. There's been more of a balance in Fairfield between understanding the role that nature plays and balancing that with development. But, you know, yep. yeah, you've got you've got a different set of issues. You've got the the boating, the boaters and with the sailboats and, you know, um, and those create, you know, your own sort of tensions within Fairfield. But within Bridgeport, there is there's no one who speaks on behalf of nature other than like an organization like ourselves. Okay. So. Um, and then we've got the complexity of this estuary being half in Bridgeport and half in Fairfield. And so you could put an ordinance in place in Fairfield that's you know, very different from one in Bridgeport. There's no coordination across the two municipalities. Each of them have you know, harbor plans or you know, conservation plans, but it's only dealing with half of the estuary. And of course, it's an entire ecosystem. So nobody except us is creating a plan that looks at the entire ecosystem of the tidal estuary. And one of the big problems we have is people from coming, you know, in like six to eight vans and cars, some of them from New York, and they just come in and dozens of people go into the mud flat and start digging. And we gave a presentation before the Shellfish Commission last week, and they said they see clear signs of erosion from that. And mm -hmm. they're also taking the oysters that they plant there. These people are stealing the oysters. So it's, um, you, know, you know, we just need to have a coordination between Fairfield and Bridgeport to deal with these these issues that are causing does, damage. Does that happen on the Bridgeport side also at St. Mary's by the Sea, or is that yes. strictly built because it's easier to park and access the mud flats? Yes, and that is a big issue. So enforcement, you know, once you get the ordinances, that's one thing, but getting people to enforce it, particularly in Bridgeport, where you know somebody digging up a mud flat is not as important as somebody you know, um, causing, you know, uh, yeah. you know, it, yeah. maybe causing violence somewhere else in the city, you know, okay. so it's, it's priorities. And then the docks are another issue, you know, until we have local ordinances that prohibit docks, we're going to be, you know, defenseless in the face of you know, the new rules the state of Connecticut came down with for the 440 docks, you know, where if it's four feet wide, 40 feet long or less, it can just go in and you can't have any kind of, you can't put up any kind of a fight or have any kind of a public hearing to protest it. It's just um, as of right, as of right docks. And so that's, that's a new development that's really caused problems. Um, and as I said before, you know, costs and time, obtaining funding now uh, makes so much more sense than waiting till this thing costs a lot more money to save. So we're partnering with Save the Sound to try to obtain the funding. If we do get that $700,000 grant, and we do the studies and that takes two years to do. At the end of that, we'll be able to save the sound can apply, apply for a federal grant. And that I'm sure will be in the millions, you know? And all of this is just to, to save the tidal estuary. Now, in terms of flooding, which I know is really your interest, um, the tidal gates, um, the master plan asked, are they high enough? You know, I know they're being replaced, no. you know, will, will that address this issue? It also brought up an issue of salinity. You know, there's phragmites that are growing near the tidal gates because there isn't enough flushing. 
and um, it isn't enough salt water, so there's too much fresh water there. Um, but I know you are replacing the tidal gates. Yeah, yes, we have we have that project to replace the Turning Creek tidal gate. Um, we have the design all done. It has not gone out for bid, for bid yet to do the work because we don't we haven't identified grant funding and our our vision right now is to include both grant money and town money instead of funding it totally by the town. Okay. But, uh, part of part of that project, there is a main sewer line, a sewer siphon that runs underneath the the, the bridge and the tide gate culverts that are there. So that's going to be replaced for its next uh, 55 years of life as part of this project. So the uh, sewer commission will be involved to provide some funding. A grant hopefully will be identified and then the town will provide funding. Uh, two, things, two things that we're doing of note. One thing is that we're going to raise the head wall of that uh, tide gate so that it will, it will be com, um, conforming to the FEMA flood, 100 year flood line today, but it will also be designed so that we can add on additional heights as oh, we good. see what the progress of sea level rise is. If oh, sea excellent. level rises rises a foot in uh, 10 years, then we'll scab on the, the two extra feet. If it rises one inch in the next 10 years, then we won't spend the money to provide that extra uh, heights to it. And okay. the other thing is the other thing is that this new design will have two culverts terminating in self-regulating tide gates, where today there is one marginally operational, old, past its useful life tide gate there. Yeah. So as far as the volume of salt water to, to flush yep. that marsh upstream of the tide gates, that should improve dramatically. So the, you know, the vision would be that the Phragmites will convert to Spartina to restore the health of that marsh. Excellent, great. Um, the other thing that was identified in the master plan was the culvert underneath Turney Creek near the marina entrance is undersized, causing yes, surface yeah. flooding after storm events. Right, uh, some surface flooding, but all, but and the, again, we are, flood and erosion is, is not conservation, <clears throat> but we certainly want to be responsible citizens in everything we do. So we're mindful of that. And one of the things that little bitty culvert at Turney Road does is it starves part of the marsh uh, from the salt water exchange. Right. So if we, if we improve that culvert and that, that culvert is, is in, the, in a connected marsh system that, ha that terminates in two self-regulating tide gates. One is physically within the docking space of the marina and the other one is right at the uh, at the edge of um, Ash Creek Marsh. Okay. So yeah. the, so those those two tide gates need to be repaired, replaced, and the culvert needs to be opened up. Um, it will again, depending on the tide, with the properly functioning self-regulating tide gates and the culvert of a right size, it will help eliminate the storm water that accumulates there and also improve the flushing on the daily tide cycle. Okay, great. Um, also, I share your concern about the residential photos that were in the master plan with the sea level rise scenarios for 2100. Um, those were not sharp. We did see sharp photos when he gave the, the presentation. So we're gonna get higher resolution photos from the consultant and we'll put those uh, in the master plan presentation, um, the 68 page printed one. So those, those, might, those might turn out to be scary. If you, they if are you scary. look, we, we have on our, on our uh, webpage, we have a, I think it's a Riverside, R Riverside Drive project. Yeah. And that has some Google Earth generated future sea level yeah. levels, the, yeah. the red line, the blue line, the yellow yeah. line, yeah. and it's like Katie uh, bar the door. 
if we really get the sea level rise and then you put a big storm on top of it, yeah. uh, we're going to have to be pumping out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I know. It is scary. Um, all right. Let me see if I can move this ahead. There we go. Okay, so basically, um, the full 68 page report can be seen by going to our website, we have a dedicated website just for the erosion issues that are called, it's called www.saveourspit.org. And under the tab documents, um, if people just go under that, um, they can download the 68 page master plan. So that's it. All right, so it's it's within the Save Our Spit yep. folder on, on your website. Yeah, the, that website. Okay. Um, Any questions or concerns? Or? No, I had I had sent I had sent you a list of questions that I came up with just as I was going through the entire document, and there's I mean, there's nothing significant. There's, you know, it's just some of my. Gee, what about this? What about that? Yeah, um, we did get you some answers. Yeah, um, talking about talking about reduce mitigating the wave action that comes and impacts the sand spit. Yeah, uh, you mentioned that you're going to be looking into wave attenuation measures of some sort, and yeah, uh, I don't living, I, living I don't, shoreline. Yeah, right. And the I don't think you does your report mention the Stratford Point Reef. Reef ball? No, because that's not really considered a living shoreline. Um, Save the Sound is really um, focused on living shorelines, not putting like concrete reef balls or anything like that. They're looking at natural okay. um, living shoreline methods. And so that's going to be I, the focus. And I, and I, I, I understand that, but in my personal in my personal opinion, grasses don't take a lot of energy out of the waves. You need some kind of mass to take the energy out of the waves. And well, you need height. That's what the dune height does. Yeah, yeah you've yeah. got to have, you've got to have, and we've lost some height, and that's the problem with the barrier spit. The average height has gone down. In addition to becoming, you know, a narrower landform. When it was 60 feet wider, it absorbed the waves better. And when it was taller, it absorbed the waves better. Okay. okay. Well, thank you. We really appreciate it. Right, that's all, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. We appreciate it. All yeah. Right. As, I, as I said, Joe, we, we will put your uh, whole 2023 Ash Creek Master Plan on our website. So if anybody, you know, questions ever come up, they can go right there and get we it. We appreciate it. Oh, Thank great. you so much. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks All for right. coming. We appreciate having you as always. All <laughs> right. You have a good night. Have a good night. We're going to leave. Thank you. Bye-bye. And now we have... And now we have no quorum. Nobody's on by phone. Nobody loves us. I'm going to. Isn't that weird? There were so many people at the last meeting. They well, came from the peninsula. They were okay. How? Do you want me to stop recording? No. Okay. No. We're we're not finished with our agenda. Yet. Okay. Yes. All right. Number three. I want to hear a presentation. No, number no. Four. We did number three. Discussion of revolving plans for the Penfield Pavilion. Okay, All like right. I have that? I have some comments on that. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. Um, That's for sure. Prue mentioned how we had we had for for us for us excellent attendance at our last meeting because we published the fact that we were going to uh, give an update uh, as far as what we knew about mm -hmm. the Penfield Pavilion, its third restoration, uh, the town administration dealing with FEMA, and so forth. So since then, the Fairfield Beach Residents Association has been active in sharing what information they know, and individual people have been uh, writing to um, Select Woman uh, Kupchak.
specifically, but also the other Board of Selectmen, uh, the RT, the, um, the Democratic Caucus of the RTM has written a letter to the, the Selectmen asking for a public meeting where this can be hashed out and um, various, various subjects explored. And I, 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 do, I don't want to, so I, I will not try and speak for the administration. Um, so that will shake out as it, as it shakes out. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen there. But meanwhile, we're still waiting, as to the best of my knowledge, we're, we're still waiting to get approval or denial or questions or some response from FEMA to our proposal that we gave them. And we went over the proposal that we gave them in our last meeting. You can look at the video online of that if you're interested. Um, so that's so that's Penfield. The the other okay, the other thing that with regard to Penfield and the site, um, we have our chairwoman Becky Bunnell has written a letter to the Board of Selectmen reiterating the fact that we're uh, we're really anxious and interested to see them incorporate flooding mitigation for the residents beyond the Penfield site. And as we reported out last month that uh, First Selectman has obligated to include $100,000 for a study to that purpose in the uh, initial ask for monies to do whatever Penfield remediation happens to be done. So the administration appreciates the fact that, that we as a, as a town need to do something for the residents beyond the beach in that area. That's, sure. that's like my update on that. No discussion. Then uh, should we go to item number five? Sure. Let's go to item number five, okay. Mr. Vice Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Review status of items on the FECD project list. Um, you, have, you, you seem to have a nice paper for me. Uh, just have, well, it's with the uh, downtown museum permeability surface. I haven't heard anything about that. Is nope. going on? Nope. <laughs> I don't. I don't know. And this is. And this is just to just to go back to when Mr. Hurley phoned me during the meeting. Uh, this is one of the reasons I, I wanted to tag up with Bill Hurley. We have a number of projects. Some of them are doing like I, I commented on the uh, Riverside Drive tide gates. Right. Uh, that's that's sitting. It's all designed, but it hasn't gone out to bid yet because of the funding. Presently or currently, the uh, capital workshop is going on for the next couple of months to arrive at the capital budget for the 23-24 period. Hopefully those funds will be in there. I don't know. So next meeting, I hope to have a pretty thorough uh, rundown on all of the active projects on our project list. Okay, sounds good. Then the, the Rooster River detention area. Last I heard, everything they proposed is shot down. For example, you can't they can't build a dam, for example. We call it retention area. They call yeah. it a dam. And just, I, I haven't yeah. heard any resolutions. The one up on the golf course, and again, I don't, I don't have any comment on that I, either. I, I haven't heard anything on that either. Okay. And that, the, the high intensity wave and erosion and damage and resiliency study by University of Rhode Island. Right, um, and that I mean, we recognize, recognize that the University of Rhode Island is there because flood and erosion has had preliminary conversations with the folks up there about doing doing this kind of analysis of our shoreline, and the the focus of this analysis would be to reduce erosion along our entire. Long Island Sound coastline. Right. What methods and materials could we get permitted? First of all, what methods and materials would help mitigate erosion? And secondly, what methods and materials could get permitted by deep? Right. So the, in the ARPA funds, there were um, there was four hundred thousand oh, yeah. dollars earmarked in the ARPA funds, and that has that has not gone out for uh, a proposal from consultants. And the University, University of Rhode Island seemed to us knowledgeable in this arena, 
but we have other uh, coastal engineering firms that are also knowledgeable. So we will go out for bid and see what kind of yeah. proposals that, we that get. Four hundred thousand dollars. Is there a time limit to that? Yes, there is. I'm, I, I would be wrong if I guessed, so I won't guess. But it, but the, yes, the clock is ticking, and that 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 is a priority that flood and erosion is trying to present to the town administration. But is it up to the town administration then to get the, to get RFPs out? And yes. Yeah. That's between between engineering to write the RFPs. Purchasing to make sure they're proper form and right. and go out. For is the there bids. anything we can do? Or? We have we have uh, been encouraging engineering to start that ball rolling. Okay. Sooner okay. rather than later. Okay, sounds good. Okay. And, and Perry Green's bulkhead is uh, that's that, going nicely, I believe. Perry, Perry's Green bulkhead replacement. That um, the attempt is going to be to to do that work under a certificate of permission, which is less strenuous than getting a brand new uh, coastal permit from the EEP. The package is ready, just about ready, and race, race engineering is doing that work, and they are going to present that package to engineering I believe this week, where we have, what, three days left, or, yeah. or possibly next week, but it should be this week. And then after engineering reviews that package, it's going to go up to deep to, it, it's a request for certificate of permission. So it's going to go up to deep. They have a certain time to review it. They'll have questions, whatever, and that process goes back and forth as necessary. And the expectation is that it will result in us having a permit. Uh, then the actual construction documents can be developed and the work done probably next season, which is like in the fall rather than in the summer. But I'm not sure of that. I'm not sure of the timing. But it is, it is, that's one thing that is progressing. Now they're cooperating with the Yacht Club next door, aren't they? Or no, there's no, no there's no, no, no cooperation there. Well, um, I mean, <laughs> not that no, no not there's there's no there's no formal linkage between what the yacht what and this is Pequot Yacht Club yes. may or may not want to do on their shorefront in 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 recognition of sea level rise. So that's still to be determined. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, that takes care of the um, item five. Now, item number six. Any additional business? I have a I have a draft letter from you and uh, that you would want to send. Is that correct? Yes, the Harbor that's Management correct. Commission. Yes, that's correct. Um. So, if you've been if you've been looking at the paper, the post or yeah. the patch or the whatever, you'll see that the um, Southport Harbor Man or the Fairfield Harbor Management Commission, which is Southport Harbor. They are looking to dredge the harbor in 2023-24. And in the, in the article, it says how they're looking to use the dredge spoils to uh, spread over the oyster beds to help them or something. And right. in talking with our, our chairwoman, she said, gee, we, we really should get our ore in that water so that yeah. they're aware that we can use sand on our beaches. Now, the, the asterisk there is the sand has to be of the proper size, it, it can't have any con, uh, chemical contaminants in it and so forth, so it has to be suitable. Right. We have, uh, we funded what we call the Engineered Beaches Project, right. and that resulted, and that was done by race engineering, that resulted in profiles that we should established for all of our town beaches and these profiles will give a, a nice a nice bathing shoreline and we should maintain these profiles over time and the benefit of this in addition to having a nice beach area for our residents to enjoy the benefits of this would be to have get FEMA reimbursement after the next big storm Next big storm happens if the wind if the waves are going the right way it takes all our sand away and we've got crummy beaches. So if the government declares that large storm a disaster, FEMA comes in and says, "Hey, how can we help you?" And we would be in um, in a, 
of a posture to say, you can help us by restoring these town beaches that got totally decimated by the storm wave action. And FEMA would hopefully participate in, in providing that restoration. After we answered the question, yes, sir, we've been taking care of our beaches on, an, on a, every second year, we bring in sand or we move sand around to restore the engineered profile of the beach. So, as way of a windy introduction. So this would be a letter from Flood and Erosion Control Board to the Harbor, Harbor Management Commission. And it just says, Dear Chairman Taylor and members of the commission, we understand from recent articles in the CT Post and looking at your 12-6-2022 presentation that you are planning to dredge Southport Harbor during 2023-24 dredging season. We would like to highlight for your consideration that a potential and desirable use of suitable dredge spoils would be to redistribute acceptable sand onto town beaches. The town commissioned a study and action plan during 2016-17 for a project termed engineered beaches. The objective is to re-nourish and maintain our beaches to design profile such that when another Sandy-esque storm hits us, the cost to restore the beaches profile could be reimbursed by FEMA. Plus, maintaining the beaches can only enhance our residents' enjoyment of them. You can find a copy of the study report in our files and documents section with a link included. We welcome any questions you may have at this point on behalf of the Flood and Erosion Control Board. Thank you. Yeah. So we, um, we cannot take in. I, I circulated this to all our members before the meeting, and right. Becky Bunnell and Paul Landino have indicated that they agree with sending this out um, but we cannot we cannot take an official action tonight. But my understanding is we can do a sense of the body, and that is only the members present. So if the right. sense of the body is that we should send this to just put our stake in the ground and say, hey, you know, remember us when you're figuring out um, what to do, we should the, do that. The only change I read, the first paragraph there say it's, it's um the first paragraph. We would like to highlight your, for your experience the potential and desirable use of suitable stuff. I would like to be more forceful. We would like you to consider the possibility of giving us sand or something to that effect. It would be a little more forceful. I read that. Are we really asking for, the, for them to give it to us? We're just suggesting it would be nice. I, I thought it would be a little more forceful. Say, would you please consider the, the possible possibility of giving us some sand? Something of that nature to it. Okay. That's my only suggestion. I would like to be a little more forceful in um, re requesting that we get some of the sand. Well, otherwise, I think it's an excellent, an excellent letter. Yeah, I, I, I'm just, I'm just thinking we're like. It was a little bit too wishy-washy. Who's, no, who's, like, who's sand is this anyway? You know. That's right. Because sand <laughs> comes from all over. Is the town, is it the town's sand? Is it the property of the Harbor Commission, state of Connecticut? Uh, state, of, yeah, state of Connecticut. So I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I would ex because part of this is before you can dredge, you have to analyze what that sand is because right. deep Army Corps of Engineers, everybody cares what you do with dredge spoils. So you have to know what you're dealing with yeah. when that starts coming and. Harbor Commission works through public works as we work through public works. Okay. So my expectation is that public works uh, will be the um, the facilitator, if you will, for what's the best use right. of this. Because you know our Shellfish Commission and and the fact that we have these oyster beds out there, and a lot of our residents go oystering and clamming, I guess. But oystering is is like the preferred thing. Um, so that's you know that's important too. So. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see. I'll I'll, I'll punch that up a now, little bit. We, we so, can send the letter without having a, a, an official. Vote. I will I will uh, I will figure that out. But so for purposes of this meeting tonight, we have two members in attendance in person and no other members present. I have received uh, communication from two other members that they are in agreement with sending this letter to the Harbor Commission. Okay. So I I believe it's appropriate to 
for us members present to decide that a sense of this body is what's reflected in this letter. Fair enough. I agree. So with that. if we if we if letter you and I agree on that, yeah, I will I will double check it that that's within within the rules. And if it is, I'll punch up the uh, please give us sand yeah. portion it's and send it. Okay. Otherwise, I, so that's what that is. there any other items? You yeah, I have one. I have one item. <clears throat> And this, I mean, nobody's nobody's here to listen. But so I sent <laughs> I sent this I sent this around to uh, to our to our our members and also copied Bill Hurley on it. And people may or may not be aware that for the New York New Jersey area, there's this huge Army Corps of Engineers project going on. Yes. And Billions. the intent the intent of it is to keep the next storm sandy or the next storm sandy plus from having such a devastating effect on Manhattan and also the outer boroughs right. and Staten Island, New Jersey. So it's the it's the Army Corps of Engineers HATS plan, H A T S. Harbor and Tributary System is what that stands for. So they're putting all kinds of tide gates and living shorelines and, and movable floodgates across the harbor and everything else. So the point the point of me highlighting this is, and, and I'll just read an excerpt from the email that I sent it around with. Generally, the plan is to spend $52.6 billion. <laughs> Excuse me. God bless you, Prue. Thank you. $52.6 billion. I know that's that's a very allergic number, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. No wonder you sneezed at that. From 2030 to 2044, a federal non federal split is 65 35, where 65% is provided by federal and 35% of the total cost has to be matched by non federal entities, state, town, uh, a grant from the National Wildlife Foundation, whatever, including, and this and this is what kind of jumped out at me, including $5.2 billion coming from the New York, New Jersey portion to acquire land, secure the land rights, and relocate occupants. The total land is 531.4 acres, and the total parcels is 1,590 parcels. So if you just do the simple arithmetic, three quarters of an square mile. Each acre, that's an average of ten point nine two million dollars per acre they're going to spend, Oof. and an average of three point six five million dollars per parcel. So I guess once again the lawyers get rich or something because. And where is know. this? All all over, all over oh. New York, New York and New Jersey. It does not come into Connecticut, okay. so it is. It is not on Connecticut. It's not on Connecticut DEEP's radar screen, but my point is mm -hmm. expensive. This mitigation stuff. If someone's allowing physical structures to be built too. Well, that's New York and New Jersey. It's isn't not it? Connecticut. <laughs> oh well. Um, so that's a, that's just an awful lot of money. And and the 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 linkage there is that when we had the Army Corps do a study for our town, they came up with. 500, 530 million. I'm, I'm trying to go from memory. 530 million, where the town would have to kick, kick in because it's always a federal, non-federal split. The town would have had to kick in like a mil, 103 million dollars or something, and we just right. weren't ready to do that. Our, we don't have the capacity to spend that kind of money in one fell swoop. So, it's expensive. This stuff. So the the hesitancy of of people to just jump right on board when the rubber hits the road. I mean, everybody just in common conversation, yeah, build a flood wall, yeah, do this, yeah, do that. But when it comes to getting the money together, it's a hurdle. Staggering, staggering. And Mr. Vice Chairman, that's all I have. Okay. And I would therefore suggest sure? make no a motion. Is no one on the? Uh, no, no one's on. It's just three, okay. Then. Make a motion that we adjourn. Make, okay. At, what is it? Seven fifty. Seven fifty. I said, okay. The meeting will officially come to an end. We, will vote. we don't need a vote because it's not a meeting. Is that correct? And we can stop the recording. Yeah. Yep. Right. Thank you. One second. Thank you all.